Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? All right. So, last lecture. Uh, I think it's going to be the last lecture that you're going to have new material. Okay. Uh, and then we'll start getting you guys ready for your test. Now, what I can tell you about your test is it's going to be very uh, information based. Uh, and it's going to be given at 8.30. I'm putting on my socks because the floor is cold. Um, it's going to be very information-based, not very conceptual-based. What I mean by that is I don't want you to be spending five minutes on one question. Questions are going to be very straightforward. Um, uh Give list uh, two functions of the brachioradialis, elbow flexor, uh, radial ulna joint in anatomical position. Elbow flexor, radial ulna joint pronator. Elbow flexor, radial ulna joint supinator. Elbow extensor, radial ulna joint pronator. Bang, bang, bang. So uh, the test is going to be given on Moodle. And it is going to be at our regular scheduled class time, 8.30 to 9.20. Again, straightforward questions uh, that is meant for you to just you know it or you don't. In addition, we're going to be using all of the verbiage in my class that I've used in all the lectures. So if you are if you got your cell phone ready to Google stuff, uh, you, you better use my verbiage. Okay. Also, this is not meant to be an open book test. This is supposed to be basing what you know. All right. In addition, Friday and Monday, I'm going to stream live during class time and do Q&A. However, let me clarify the kind of questions I will answer and the kind of questions I, I can't answer. I say I won't answer. I can't. Uh, will this be on the test? Will that be on the test? If I lectured about it, it can be on the test. Everything is fair game that I'm not going to waste your time lecturing on stuff that's not important. Um, so the kind of questions I will answer is, Dr. Campbell, in this lecture, you talked about this. Can you clarify that? Dr. Campbell, in that lecture, you mentioned this and this and this. Can you give another example of that? Uh, I'm not going to answer open-ended questions. Uh, I'm going to answer and clarify very specific questions. And that way, there's reciprocity there. I know that you guys have done your part to watch the videos and to study, and I will do my part to help you uh, make sure uh, that everything is clear. If, if you haven't watched any of the videos, that's what leads to open-ended questions. Can you go over what we need to know? The lectures go over what you need to know. So the answer is, yeah, just go watch them and then come back for clarifications. OK, so uh, so let's get to the last stuff I'm going to teach you. So last class, I talked about torques and moments, rotational influences and um, how as the force gets further and further away, the torque increases as the force gets closer and closer. The torque decreases the moment. So in rehab and exercises, since gravity, if gravity is the force that you're going up against, gravity is limited in its direction. So it can change its perpendicular distance based on your change in position. So what I mean by that is imagine someone's doing um, a fly exercise and their arms are here, so the force of gravity is parallel to the axis of rotation. It's passing right through the axis of rotation. So here, there is no force trying to horizontally abduct me or horizontally adduct me. The force is trying to pass. Uh, the force is trying to translate me, not necessarily rotate me. So in this position with a dumbbell in my hand, uh, very little moment. And you could feel that when you get up over your head. Yeah, you, it takes muscles to stabilize. Um, 
but not a lot of torque. But as you lower it down, it gets harder and harder and harder and harder. It gets harder and harder and harder and harder because the force stays the same. But the moment arm, the torque arm, gets greater and greater and greater and greater. So therefore, the rotational influence gets greater and greater and greater. The moment increases. And it's not because the force increases. It's because of the moment arm, the torque. So because the external torque gets greater, well, your internal torque has to get greater. And because your muscles can't detach and insert further away, their only option to keep up with the increase in torque is just to pull harder. So it's kind of cool. Torque is force in perpendicular distance. With the external torque, the force stays the same. Perpendicular distance increases. For your muscles, the perpendicular distance stays the same, so the force has to increase. So in essence, the, the trade-off here is increase in perpendicular, perpendicular distance, increase in muscle force. Okay. Now, when you do a machine, machines maintain more consistent moments because machines can actually redirect their force, unlike gravity. So if you get into a fly machine and you're in this position, the perpendicular distance is here. And as you change your range of motion, so doeth the perpendicular distance. So that's one of the benefits of machines. Machines maintain more consistent torques. And if the machine is maintaining a more consistent torque, then your muscles can maintain a more consistent force. Okay. What's one of the negatives about machines? They're expensive and they take up a lot of room. So the trade-off to having a consistent external torque is uh, expensive space consumers. So, uh, and sometimes in if you're doing home rehab, you're going to have all that fancy machine. So you have to figure out how to do consistent torque. So let's think about some ways that you can cheaply create consistent moments. So let's say I'm working with someone at their house and they have a dumbbell in their hand and I want to try to maintain a consistent moment. I could externally, I can manually resist them and change the amount of force that I'm pulling in different parts of the range of motion, depending on when the torque is the highest or when the torque is the lowest. What I mean by that is when their hands are up here, that's when I'm going to try to pry them apart a little bit harder. And as they lower themselves down, I'm going to push a little less, little less, little less, little less. As they come up, I'm going to push a little bit more, 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 more. So understanding torques and moments can allow you to change influence on their range of motion if you're um, if you're doing so. Uh, in addition, if you're you know if you're working out with somebody and they're doing shoulder press, try this. When they're at the top, once you can socially distance, when they're at the top and you're spotting, try to pull their arms apart because at the top there is no very little torque. So if they get here, you could try to pull their arms apart. Excuse me. So you could try to pull their arms apart at the top and create torque, create moment. So understanding when torque is um, and moment is the least and the greatest can behoove you as a fitness professional, athletic trainer, or therapist. Let me give you some more uh, examples. Um, I think I used this one last time, but uh, let's say um, you're doing, let me pull up one on the old Google and see if we could see it on the screen. Okay, watch. So let's say you're working with an athlete. Uh, of course, Google's not going to be working. Let me get on the Wi-Fi. Weefy. Yay, Weefy. Okay, there we go. Okay, so let's see. This is cuff. So let's put a cuff on. Okay, so here's a good one. Get that. Us. Okay. All right. Let's see if they have a, OK, 
Okay, we did this one last time. Let's see. Okay, anybody see that? So the greatest torque is going to be in this position, in an extended position. Not that it's always going to be in an extended position, but based on her hip and knee position and gravity pulling down, gravity is going to be furthest away from the knee joint perpendicularly in this position. This is going to be where it's the hardest. When her knee is in a flexed position, like her other leg, that's the easiest. She could hold that position forever. Her muscles aren't working because they don't need to work. Nothing's trying to flex or extend her when the force of gravity is parallel. When the force of gravity is going through her axis, not perpendicular from her axis. So the point is, is that as she extends, the external moment gets greater and greater and greater because the force application is getting further and further and further away from the axis perpendicularly. So therefore, her muscles, which don't have the advantage of getting further and further away, they just have to pull harder and harder and harder to make up for it. As she flexes, the moment goes less and less and less and less. So again, as a therapist, knowing this, if you're trying to maintain a more consistent moment, as she extends, you push less. And as she flexes, you push more, especially when she's in 90 degrees, you need to give a little push there to create an external torque in a direction of knee flexion so that her extensors can work against it. So that's the, the advantage of having ankle cuffs or dumbbells or free weights is that they don't take up a lot of space. They're cheaper, but you got to know how to, you got to be creative with them. It's not, think of it like this. Machines are like uh, ready-made meals that they're already prepped. You just got to put it in an oven and heat it. Free weights, dumbbells, ankle cuffs, that's, you got to know how to cook. You got to know how to create the environment to optimize um, uh, these exercises with, uh, with external forces and torques and moments, okay? So looking at something like this, and even with resistance, so watch, let me... Um, let me do one with a TheraBand where you're like, well, there's, see, like something like this. Okay, so here's, there's a TheraBand. Okay, but again, that's not going to be consistent the whole time. Right? You know, as you flex, as you extend. So the only, I say the only way, without external forces... Uh, without manual resistance or, or, or someone there that can kind of help change it. Uh, extension machine. That's why the machines, uh, that's why the machines do a good job is because with the machine, the machine changes the direction of its force in order to keep a more consistent torque. So in other words, when you extend the padding is pushing perpendicular. As you flex, the padding is pushing perpendicular. The pad changes its direction of its force to maintain perpendicularity. Gravity, if she just had, if he just had ankle cuffs, gravity can't do that. Gravity does this. Greater, less. Greater, less. Greater. This is what the machine does. Same. 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 Now, again, don't get caught up with, for that example, extended was more torque and flex was less. If the person did those same examples, but instead of sitting down, they were on their back. Well, now the greatest torque would be in a flexed position. And as they extend, the torque would get less. As they flex, the torque would be gr greater, less, greater. So again, as a, as a future therapist, personal trainer, knowing that you can reposition yourself, um, the concept is, is that you want muscles to work in full ranges of motion, but not necessarily in the same range of motion. 
what I mean by that is muscles uh, have windows of strength gains. Uh, they're angle dependent is what I'm trying to say. So my point is, is that let's say you're doing your work in your knee extensors and you know that in an extended position is going to be working more than a flex position. Well, if you think about it, if all you ever did was that, then the muscles are going to be stronger here than they are here. The, this never gets stressed. This never gets a workout. So knowing that, and if you don't have the machine available and you don't do the manual resist, and what you could do is say, well, I need to get the same amount of work here as I do here. So maybe I can reposition myself so that now this is where they're working the most and this is where they're working the least. And it, it, it's similar to a lot of different exercises, especially with cables. So imagine someone's doing a cable crossover or some kind of pull and, and the cable is pulling out this way and you know that the torque is the greatest here and it gets easier. Now it's parallel, here it's perpendicular. So knowing that I'm getting the most work in this position, well, I need to try to get some stress in this position. So what you could do is you could literally just reposition your body so that the torque is the greatest here and it's the least here. So you can do a set of, you know, six or seven. Next set, reposition yourself. Next set, reposition yourself. Or you could do it uh, within the same range of motion where you do like four or five pulses here. Reposition yourself four or five pulses here. So that's the intent of me trying to teach you guys the importance of torque or moment and the application to exercise uh, is with machines. Machines do the changing of the direction of the force for you, more consistent moment at the expense of cost and space. Um, dumbbells, free weights, ankle cuffs, cheaper, take up less space, but they are limited in their force production being down. So you have to be creative to reposition yourself. Uh, to, to, so fixed directional force, variable body position. Um, in the machine, fixed body position, variable directional force. Okay. All right. Next up, let's go to what does it mean to take the next step with torques and moments, and that's levers. Okay, um, a lever is a, a force arrangement that takes advantage of one or more functions of a simple machine. And I have the functions of a simple machine here. It's also in your book. All right, so I'm gonna put this on here, pause it if you need. Functions of simple machines. All right, so functions of simple machines, balance, multiple forces, change direction of applied force. I, I talked about that on Monday. Advantage speed, advantage um, force. There's a lot of trade-offs in there. What you gain in one, you lose in another. What you lose in one, you gain in another. So traditionally, biomechanics have looked at levers like, like mechanics look at levers, like, like uh, um, engineers look at levers. And although the concept are the same, the applications are far different. What I mean by that is uh, in, in mechanics, we can look at uh, examples of leverage and like wheelbarrows are a second and uh, teeter-totter is a first. And the body, it's a lot more complicated because remember, you can, you can flip things. You, you, the door rotates about the wall the wall will never rotate about the door. In biomechanics though, the door can rotate about the wall or, or the wall can rotate about the door. That happens all the time with us. Movable hand or fixed hand, movable body, all right? So what I'm trying to get to is that for your body's movement strategies, remember sequence, simultaneous, all that stuff, you are gonna incorporate the leverage that you need uh, that gives you a certain advantage for what you're trying to do. So in other words, in biomechanics, in true mechanics, there is no such thing as the elbow is a, the ankle is a, the knee is a, 
meaning that the elbow is a third or the knee is a second. Jack is going to be what you need it to be. What I mean by that is uh, if I need to balance certain things, I'm going to utilize leverage that gives balance an advantage. Um, if I'm trying to redirect forces, I gave you that example uh, yesterday where if this is my pelvis, let's say this is my pelvis and I'm bending over. So like I have anterior pelvic girdle rotation bend over. Pulling hamstrings down on the back end makes the front end go up. Here's my axis on my hips. Redirection of an applied force. Pulling down on this end makes the other end go up. So it depends on what you need. So my job here is to give you the functions of a simple machine, to explain what those functions are then to apply them to leverage for a second, third class. And then to basically say, hey, if you need a balance, this is what you're going to probably use. And let's look at how we can use it. If you need speed, this is what you can use. And this is how you're going to probably use it. And if you need uh, force, this is what you're going to use. And this is how you're going to use it. Okay. So functions of simple machines, again, change direction of applied force, balance multiple forces, advantage speed, advantage force. The components of leverage is F, A's, and R's, but that needs to be defined as well because you could have multiple forces. Uh, and you can even define the axis different ways. What I mean by that is uh, if this pin is rotating, where's the axis? And you may say, well, it's here. And you're not incorrect, but I could also look at the axis as the center of mass of the pencil. What I mean by that is with general motion from here to here is the same as here, here, and then rotate about the center of mass of the pencil. So that makes leverage in the human body difficult as well because you've got to define your axis. And your axis isn't necessarily or doesn't have to be defined at the joint. I know that's creepy, but it's true. It doesn't have to be. It could be defined by the center of mass of the bone or the center of mass of the segment. That messes with a lot of stuff because if you can move the axis to here, well, now all of a sudden, everything becomes a, a first class type of leader. So the point is, is that traditionally we look at F, A, and R. F is a force. A is an axis. R is a resistance. But a resistance is a force. Right? I mean, if I'm doing weights, the weight, the dumbbell is a force. So F and R are both forces. Typically in biomechanics, when we're applying levers, we look at the F as your intrinsic muscle force. The, the F for our class is going to be what muscle are we talking about? And another thing that's tough about applying this to biomechanics, too, is that you got a lot of different muscles. So in other words, if you've ever seen a lever example where they do the elbow, and they say, well, here's the axis, here's your bicep, and then there's your resistance. Well, there's other muscles. What about your brachioradialis? It's way over here. So you, you, every leverage scenario is muscle dependent in terms of uh, those arrangements per muscle. Uh, the biceps leverage is going to be different than the brachioradialis's leverage. Uh, the iliopsoas leverage is going to be different than the rectus femoris leverage. You see what I'm trying to say? So in biomechanics, it is not as correct to define levers based on joints. We can't do it for two reasons that I just gave you. One is, is that the axis doesn't have to be at the joint. We can look at the axis as the center of mass of, of the bone itself. And number two, there's several different muscles that are pulling in seven different places. So we can't say the ankle is a, the knee is a, the elbow is a. We can't say that. We can't say the elbow is a third and the, 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 the hip is a first. And it, it all depends. It depends on how we're setting it up and how we set it up is what do we need from it. Okay. So. F is muscle, whatever muscle we're looking at. A is the axis, whatever axis we define, and R is the resistance, external influences for the most part, ground, gravity, that kind of stuff, right? So 
First class is what we find a majority of times because first class levers can serve all four functions of a simple machine, just not all four at the same time, but it could do three at the same time. Balance two or more forces. So you think about a teeter totter, right? For the first, where the axis is in between my two different forces, muscle resistance. So you think about a teeter totter and how with a teeter totter, if I have a big force here, how I can balance it by shifting the axis closer, making this moment arm less, making this moment arm greater. So for less force, it can balance out a bigger force. Uh, and you, you guys know this from playing on, this, on the teeter-totter. If you have a bigger brother or sister who's older and heavier, they can slide up on the teeter-totter and balance you out who's further away. Okay balancing forces so think about in the body when we balance when we weight bear we balance when we're maybe doing a stork stand where you're balancing on one leg but we balance all the time uh, when we're walking when when our legs are on single support we're balancing when our legs are on double support we're balancing we're constantly redistributing and balancing changing the center of mass over our base of support because of first class leverage. So think about this. When you're standing and you notice you sway, it's not a lot, but you're swaying around. That's because your, let's, let's pretend this is a hip. That's because your hip flexors and your hip extensors are constantly kind of pulling and tugging to balance. And your abductors and your adductors are constantly pulling to balance. And then you got the resistance. Your, your body mass is constantly swaying around. And, and uh, the, the essence is your muscles, it's like a level where you're trying to keep the bubble centered. So your flexors, your extensors, your abductors, your adductors are constantly trying to keep that bubble centered, trying to keep your resistance parallel to your axis to maintain your balance. So first class leverage of multiple muscles plus your resistance is great at balance. And that could be balancing weight. You know, if you have a weight out here and you're trying to balance it, notice your arm's gonna sway a little bit. That's because all these different muscles are working in a first class lever arrangement with your axis being in the middle to try to maintain balance. Okay. Uh, your your First class leverage for balance for your eyes. Remember uh, how important it is to keep travel. So you have your cervical vertebra here. You have your resistance trying to flex you. You have your cervical extensors trying to extend you. It's balance. Balance. Keeping your eyes level is about balance. Um, so balance the arrangement of multiple forces with the axis in the middle and they're working together uh, uh, for balance, okay? Now, first class levers can also have an advantage of speed or force if you shift the axis around. I'm gonna give you an example here. To me, this is the best. Uh, so imagine, imagine you're at a circus and uh, you have this teeter-totter that's not like a teeter-totter you would find at the park, but this teeter-totter is meant so that the uh, acrobats can shoo. And as you know, if you have like an acrobat here that wants to get flown in the air and do spins, the people that jump and land on this side usually jump from very high up so that they have very high forces because you need a very high force because what you don't have here is a large torque, large moment arm torque on. So you better have large forces on this end in order to even make the other end fly up. But if you can, if you can generate enough force on this end with the disadvantage of the moment arm, the other end is going to go very fast. And I have a little picture. This is just in, in layman's terms to help explain that concept. So here we have a, a lever and we're going to apply a great force on this end. And the lever point on this end is going to go from A to B. Now, look how small of a distance that is. 
and you can look at this linearly or you could look at this arcly, angularly, arc distance, radians. It's not very far. But look at the other end. Great distance. Now, I know that unless this board snaps, A to B on this end is going to occur at the exact same amount of time as A and B on that end. What I mean by that is when this dot gets here, this dot is going to get up here. So if this end is traveling a much greater distance in the same amount of time, it's got to be going fast. Make sense? That's the concept of stepping on the rake, where in the movies, when you step on the rake, your foot only moves a little distance, but the end of the rake has to get to its end in the same amount of time as your foot. So if it's traveling farther in the same amount of time, it has to be going faster. One more way to look at this is if you and a friend are running around a track and your friend is running on the outside lane and you're running on the inside lane. And you start together, you run all the way around the track and you cross the finish line together. They ran further than you, but they ran the lap in the same amount of time. They had to be going faster than you. Okay. So in this example, we still have a first class leverage arrangement axis in the middle of two forces. But because the axis was closer to my force, I have a disadvantage in force application at an advantage of speed production when I change the direction of those forces, okay? So, um, and this is a great example of change direction of a force. A force going this way is going to redirect the other side to go up, okay? So that's an example of how we can get an advantage of speed. In the body, we can get advantage of speeds from our quad, right? Our knee extensors, they insert very close to the knee joint. So for them, a short change in distance creates a large sweeping range of motion of the leg and open chain. So you think about kicking a football as far as you can, you need to make your foot go fast. A movement strategy, sequence motion, is going to rely a lot on um, speed arrangements of leverage. And uh, specifically, those would be looked at as third classes. Third classes are when the muscle, right, the muscle is pulling very close to the axis in an open chain situation. So, uh, tricep elbow, bicep at the elbow, again, open chain. So in other words, a short contraction distance here creates a sweeping range of motion over there, right? Now, again, you think about, well, when I need third class, I need to make something move fast, running, sprinting, functioning. You, you got to make distal segments move fast and sequence motion and third class leverage arrangement. It's where I'm going to recruit muscles that insert very close to an axis to short distance change close creates long distance change far. Okay. So third class always has the advantage of speed and range of motion because the muscle is closer to the axis than the resistance. That's mechanical answer to why. And then with second class arrangements, now in the body, you want muscles that insert far away. This is going to be used great for slowing down motion or generating large amounts of force on something. Keep in mind force velocity graphs. If you're lifting something heavy, you're not going to do it fast. So think about if, uh, if I have five pound dumbbell in my hand and I'm trying to recruit my elbow flexors with as much force as possible. I'm going to move it fast, but take out the five and put a 10. It's going to go slower. Take out the 10 and put 15. Take out the 15 and put 35. I'm still recruiting my muscles as much as possible, but the more weight I put, the slower it's going to move. So the point is, is that if you're generating maximum force or, or large amounts of force on something, 
inherently that's going to contradict going fast. And so the trade-off is, is that uh, you're going to be incorporating more second-class muscle arrangements, meaning, bottom line, meaning muscles that insert far away from the axis. So let's take a look at this in reverse. Instead of looking at uh, this to here does this to here, let's do it in reverse. And let's look at how a force way over here can produce a large torque on the other end because look how far the lever arm is. So that's the old uh, <clears throat> silly example where there's a boulder stuck on someone and you can't move the boulder. So you take a, 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 a pole and you put a rock and you have a large lever arm. You, you get the advantage of the torque arm. We call them cheetah sticks when the, when the, when the nuts on the, on the car and you, you can put a pipe and increase the torque arm. So the trade-off is, is that you have your advantage of your force, but it's not going to make the nut spin very fast. It's going to only spin very slow. You got to put it back in slow, slow, slow and strong. And then once you loosen it up, then you say, oh, the heck with the cheetah stick with your hands real close to the axis. It makes it spin fast. Okay. So examples of second class in the body are muscles that insert very far away. So, um, when you're sprinting, slowing down the hip extension, your rectus femoris inserts very far away from the hip. So that's a good brake muscle. It's a good slower down muscle. Hamstrings are great brake muscles at the hip. Uh, the gastrocnemius is a great brake muscle at the knee. Um, the biceps brake eye is a great brake muscle at the shoulder because of how far it inserts away from the shoulder. Okay. So the point is, is that within muscle groups, you have certain muscles that have the advantage of speeding you up, and you have other muscles that have the advantage of slowing you down. So uh, iliopsoas is a great third class at the hip because of how close it inserts to the hip. So when you're trying to flex your hip real fast, as fast as possible, that's a great muscle to help speed you up. The rectus femoris isn't a very good speeder upper muscle in terms of trying to speed you up as fast as you can but it's a great slower down muscle of hip extension. Now, the last point I'm going to bring up is with leverage and muscles. So in biomechanics, leverage is muscle dependent. And again, it's what you need. If you need balance, first class. If you need redirection of an applied force, meaning I pull down on one end and the other end goes up, first class. If I need speed, you're looking at third classes and first classes that have an advantage of speed. If you're looking at maximum force, you're looking at second classes and first class that, gave it, that gives advantage in force. Okay. The last thing I'm going to tell you that you're going to have to know is fast leverage muscles can go slow, but slow leverage muscles can go fast. It's easy to understand. A professional sprinter like Usain Bolt, the fastest man in the world. And let me give you someone who's slow compared to Usain Bolt. Here's Usain Bolt and me running a sprint. <laughs> Usain Bolt is fast. I'm slow. Usain Bolt can choose to run slow. Usain Bolt, a fast functioning human, can choose to go slow. I can't choose to go fast. So what I mean by that is, even though second class muscles have an advantage of force, every muscle can help to generate maximum force. In other words, even the third class muscles can help generate torque for maximum force production because maximum force is inherently going to be slow. When you're trying to impart a large force onto something, that's going to be slow. So these fast sprint type muscles can choose to help when you're trying to generate as much force as possible onto something. However, slow torque, high torque muscles, second class muscles cannot choose to go fast. 
So when you're flexing and, and, and extending as fast as you can, muscles that insert far away can't be innervated. I'll give an example. Research has shown that they've done electromography studies. When you flex your knee as fast as possible, your gastrocnemius doesn't turn on because it contracts fast enough to keep up with the hamstrings and the other muscles that are knee flexors. So slow leverage muscles cannot choose to work fast, but fast leverage muscles can work slow. Okay. All right. That's enough for today. So go over levers. It's all in your book. And uh, Friday, I'll clarify things. Monday, clarify things, get you ready for your test. Uh, on next Wednesday. Next Wednesday's test, 8.30 to 9.20. Set, set an alarm. All right. Uh, confirm in the comments with, uh, uh, let's see, happy hump day. Sounds good. Later.